the Rotama Cafe podcast, episode 79, Understanding Our Behavioural Biases, with special guest, Neil Page. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. Here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is brought to you by the Timeline app. Timeline is a retirement income planning software that helps financial planners like me bring your retirement journey to life and answer your big retirement income questions. Now, you may know that in addition to the Retirement Cafe podcast, we also run live Retirement Cafe events. These are informal events to give people an opportunity to learn more about the issues, opportunities and challenges that may affect their retirement over coffee and cake. Now, we obviously haven't been able to run any of these events in recent months. So I decided to take those coffee mornings online and I've been inviting along special guests to discuss their uh, viewpoint and inform our clients and audience. So this week I'd like to share with you a discussion between uh, the guests at the recent retirement Virtual Retirement Cafe Coffee Morning and special guest Neil Beige, who's the founder of award-winning behavioral insights company BIQ and a specialist on subconscious behaviours that drive our decisions. Neil explains the different behavioural biases that we're all prone to and how to understand them and gives us tips on how to navigate the current landscape during these challenging times. As always, this episode is available to watch on our YouTube channel, The Retirement Cafe Podcast. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy our discussion with Neil Beige about behavioural biases. I'm really pleased this morning to be uh, joined by Neil Bage, who is uh, runs a company called BIQ. Uh, and you can find their web address, biq.co.uk. And he's an expert in behavioral insights. So uh, welcome to the Retirement Cafe, Neil. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> now, I know you're not very far from us, actually. You're over on, the, you're over on, you know, you're on that tropical island, the Isle of Wight there, right? I'm on the west side of the Isle of Wight, yeah, um, which is which is a, which is a, you know at the best of times where I live is quiet. This obviously now it is deathly quiet. And it was um we had a really strange weekend last weekend, Easter weekend, which is typically the busiest weekend on the island, especially with the weather we had. Um, and my wife and I and our little dog went for a walk on the beach, and it was sand and seagulls. It was it was it felt apocalyptic. It really did. Some really strange. It's quite moving, actually, and, and and you know, so um, yeah, strange, strange times, but um, you know, it, it it'll it'll pass and things will get back to normal soon, hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Neil, um, obviously, we we've, we've known each other for a while, and we've chatted a number of times about uh, about the great work that you do. for for the um for the audience today, can you explain uh, a little bit about who BIQ are and uh, and and what you do and, and why you do it? I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So, so let me kind of take you back. So, BIQ is a is a behavioural insights company, which sounds quite grand and, and and meaningless actually. So, let me tell you what what the background to the business quickly. Um, I won't dwell on that, and what and because that gives you an insight into what I mean. So, I have worked in financial services for twenty odd years now, and I've always worked with the kind of the, the client, the end client, people on this call, and. And one of the things that has always struck me is that when this industry deals with people, they, they assume that people have either a certain level of knowledge, a certain level of technical competency, um, that they understand the language we use, and ask them to make and ask you to make decisions um, on the assumption that you are absolutely perfectly attuned to what's going on and therefore can make a decision. And I studied sports psychology and human biology. And one of the things that you learn in sports psychology is what goes on in your head is absolutely incredibly powerful and dominates the way that we interact with the world around us. We take information in, we process it unconsciously, and that ends up being a part of the DNA of the decision that we end up making. And I was sitting one day in a in a well-paid job, you know, in for a big financial services company, a FTSE 100 company. Um, I was just one of the 
um, senior managers there. And, and I just thought, this is all wrong. This is all wrong. We should be trying to help people make safer decisions. We should be revealing to people what's going on in their heads so that they can be forearmed to make better decisions. And, and that's not to say people don't make good decisions. But what I'm saying is, when you wrap money and financial decisions around that, it can create an inner conflict um, where we where we know we have to do something, but we sometimes struggle to to find the, the path to, to to make the right choice. So I left my job. I quit my job and set up a company, um, self funded for a couple of years, to, to, and that was interesting. Um, with the with the ambition to do what exactly that to figure out a way of allowing anybody to um, go through some kind of process where it reveals to them in black and white the unconscious behaviors that are going through their brain when they are making decisions. And this links to what to two things, what psychologists will call heuristics, which are shortcuts that we take when we are processing information, and our behavioral biases, which are in essence the filters we apply to the information that we receive to make a decision. Now, what you find is that the way that psychologists test for behavioral bias is typically in a lab. They get people in, they spend a day with them, prodding and poking them and asking them questions and, and, and in some instances wiring them to electrical tests to see how far they behaviorally will go. And, and then they say, okay, we understand your behaviors. Well, of course, we can't do that. What I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to put those tests, take them out of a lab and put them in an iPhone or a mobile device. I wanted anybody to be able to pick up their phone and play a game that revealed the same behavioral biases that were being revealed in a lab by people in white coats. So are you saying, though, that we are making silly decisions? No, I no. We make decisions that we genuinely believe are will serve us in you know will serve our interests and are aligned to our values and our guiding principles. But what happens is when we get bombarded with information, we that information can distort our reality without us realizing it's being distorted. So let me give you a really quick example. Right. You know, there there is a behavioral bias called framing, and framing is where you make a decision based on how information is presented to you, as opposed to the underlying facts or the full picture. So if I said to you, to everybody on this call, do you reckon you could retire on 70% of your current income? And most people would go, oh, possibly. And research plays this out. Most people believe that they can. Um, I framed that in a very particular way because I could have asked exactly the same question like this. Do you think you could retire on a 30% reduction in your income? Now, that question changes the way that we process the information because one is framed in a positive and one is framed in a negative. And we have a tendency as humans to focus more on the negative than we do the positive. So it's exactly the same question, but how I frame it you know that information goes into our head it goes into our unconscious processes and then as it's pushed out in the form of a decision we aren't aware that we've allowed the way the information was presented to us to infiltrate itself into the decision so we we are genuinely making decisions based on what we believe to be true and valid and reasonable without realizing that these unconscious processes are interfering with the way that we see the world does that, does that make sense, Justin? I think Justin's just, um, for some reason, <laughs> dropped off. So uh, I think he's just trying to rejoin now. So hopefully he'll be back with us in just a minute. I'm guessing he just got bored with my answer and thought, <laughs> bored, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. But, but so I'll just keep talking. For, you know, so basically, you know, framing as a, and that's just one the behavioral bias, there are hundreds of these things. You know, and, and if I kind of take us all to where we are today, you know, you see this in the news all the time. You know, what we are hearing about what's going on in the world in certain, depending on where you get your news from, is often framed in a way that the reporters want us to absorb that story. And if we just accept these stories as the source of fact, we can get into a place where we end up um, making decisions on misinformation. 
It's why, for example, with the, the current virus, my source of information is the UK government, the World Health Organization, and anybody who is giving me factual evidence-based information. That's it. Social media is not where I get my information from because that is just full of noise and it's framed and it is highly emotive. So, so we need to be careful of, of, of things like that. And that's what ultimately as a business, that's where we um that's where we got to. We ended up building an app, which is in the Apple store, which allows anybody to go through a process and figure out the strength or weakness of their individual behavioral biases and how they are manifesting themselves in the decisions that we make. I, I, ho I hope that makes sense. Justin, I think you're, Justin's back now. <laughs> oh, just unmute myself. Thank you, Neil. Sorry about that. For some reason, Sorry. Sorry. I kicked myself out of my own meeting, which um, is quite, <laughs> quite remarkable. <laughs> behavioral, behavioral biases were coming to play. So, Neil, it's, you know, we lot of, I've done a lot of reading around this, and there's, a, there's an aspect of uh, that... Um, you know, if we all made decisions kind of in a pure economic way, we would all possibly drive very sensible cars. Mm -hmm. um, and we would all, you know, we would all, the, 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 there's probably an optimum kind of shirt we would buy and pair of trousers we would buy and, and a very you know, sensible car with the least depreciation and, um, you know, the, the, the best house that we would buy for, you know, which is going to grow at the right price. You know, there's, a, there's an econ kind of uh, way of doing it. But, uh, but, but in my experience, that a lot of decisions are made emotionally. Mm. Would you agree with that? I completely agree with that. Absolutely. I don't, uh, so, so one, our emotions play a significant part in the decisions we make. But, so this, let me just slightly backtrack. There, there's two types of behavioral bias. Right. One is what, what's called cognitive biases. And these are where we make errors in the way we process information. There is another type of bias called an effective bias, which is where we make a decision which is driven and um, affected by our emotions. And there are far more effective biases than there are cognitive biases because our emotions are such a dominant part of who we are. You know, they make, they, my emotions and my behaviors make me, me. And, and therefore, to turn off to turn off my emotions, um, it's an impossibility. Therefore, I have to accept that my emotional state will impact how I make decisions. It's why I'm a big believer on that phrase: "Sleep on it." You know, to 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 allow you to kind of um, hit the reset button, cognitively speaking, so that you you know you you, you want. I don't want to make a decision now because I'm I'm stressed and I'm angry and I'm anxious and I'm worried. I go to bed, I wake up, and I'm not in the same emotional state. Therefore, I could, could hopefully make a better decision. But, you know, there is a biological, um, you know, one of the, the, the first things you study when you study human biology is what goes on in the brain. And especially when you're studying sports psychology alongside that. And one of the things that we, you know, happens in everybody, so everybody on this call, it's a very, it's a human thing, is when we sense fear or anxiety or sorry when we are in a state of fear anxiety worry or stress what happens is there there's two parts to the brain two parts called one called the amygdala and one called the hypothalamus and i'm not going to get too technical here but basically when the brain senses any degree of fear whether that's a tiny piece or a big dangerous situation the amygdala sends a message to the hypothalamus and it says I need you to kick in what is what's technically called the sympathetic nervous system, but it's what everybody else knows typically as the fight and flight mechanism in our bodies. We either run and get the hell out of there or we stay and we fight. Um, now, the interesting thing with our, um, our sympathetic nervous system is it does the most amazing things. It shuts down your stomach, your gallbladder, your intestines. It, um, it, it, your pupils dilate, you stop, you stop producing saliva, your hearing becomes more fine-tuned, and it gets you and it pumps your body full of adrenaline. But one of the other things it does is it inhibits or it temporarily shuts down your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain sitting right at the front, which is where we reason and make decisions, which means in a heightened state of anxiety or stress or worry, 
we can't make in speech marks clear-headed decisions because the, our biology doesn't allow us to. We need to be in a state where our parasympathetic nervous system, which is where we're at rest, um, is absolutely activated, where our bodies and our brains are functioning at full capacity. Now, our emotions you know, play a significant role in triggering our sympathetic nervous system. So if I'm in a heightened state of emotion, I can very quickly flip into a, a, you know, anxiety or fear very easily, which is triggered by my emotional state and therefore get into a place where I, I'm not in the best position to make decisions. So it's a double whammy. I have my emotional state playing, um, say my psychology playing out, my emotional state, and I have my biology playing out in, in the form of my fight and flight mechanism. So, you know, we can get into a, we can get into a state of um, a messy state mm. quite quickly. And our emotions play a significant role in that. Yeah. And of course, with our current circumstances, I mean, you know, we're globally facing this pandemic and, um, you know, the, the, the businesses are facing bankruptcy and uh, people are seeing stock market investments plummet. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's real concern about people's health. Mm. Um, uh, you know, how, 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 what skills could you maybe suggest that people can use to, to kind of navigate this and say that their way through this? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, you know, you, you just even just your question, Justin, gives you the lays bare the state of where we are currently. You know, if, if all I had to deal with was a stock market falling, I could deal with that. But actually, that's not all I have to deal with today. I don't even know what the date is today. The days are blur into one now. March, so April 17th. On April the 17th, I have to deal with markets being quite volatile. We're on a, a national lockdown. You know, our partners are at home all the time. Our kids are at home all the time. Our jobs are at risk. All of these things carry their own emotional baggage anyway. Now, when they all combine into one big mess like we are in currently, it's quite difficult, actually, to put into practice any practical tips that, are, that enable us to, um, to, to navigate the kind of the current landscape. But there are two that I, that I, that I use today that help me. One of them is one that, a, a, a process I always invoke when um, there's lots going on in my life. And that is I write things down. And it sounds really silly and really simple, but I write things down. I start keeping a journal and I don't write chapter and chapter and chapter, but I write things down about what's going on, where, what, what's going on today. So yesterday, lockdown extended by another three weeks. How do I feel? I'm okay, actually, at the moment, you know, and I start writing things. So then I can refer back to, you know, big events, if you like, and, and try to figure out what, what I went through emotionally at that particular point in time. And it works for some people. It doesn't work for others. It really works for me. The other thing that I do is I always i am a big advocate of having a trusted advisor. And I don't necessarily mean a financial advisor. I mean someone who you trust explicitly to be able to share your innermost thoughts with. Someone who you can reach out to and say, I'm not okay. And they won't judge you for that. They will have a conversation with you. And the reason why this is important, and I have two people who I do this with, the reason why this is important is because I'm absorbing news and information like everybody else is. And what that means is that I'm starting to create stories and, and, and narratives in my head about what's going on in the world, but they are living exclusively in the head of Neil Beige. They're not living anywhere else. And if I don't, and I need to be able to get other input, but from a trusted source. So when I speak to my closest friend and I say to him, how are you getting on? What do you think of this? How are you seeing the world? What do you reckon is going to happen? It allows me to have a different viewpoint from someone who I love and trust. And it allows me to update my stories. And it allows me to start to see the world in a different way, potentially. And if he says, oh, my God, no, I think this is really positive because you know, what it does is it changes it, the balance of negative, positive messaging in my head and actually allows me to start to see things that I may not have been able to see. So writing things down and turning to a, someone who you trust, and that might be your, your, your husband, your wife, your kids, your best friend, your financial advisor. You know, my point is, I don't care who it is, having someone who you can trust 
to turn to, to talk to during times like this. It's, this has been proven through psychology through, through the years. Talk therapy is absolutely a crucial part of navigating um, difficult, awkward, unusual testing situations. Yeah, yeah. And I think I, the only thing I would really add to that is to, is to try to find someone who's going to be without judgment. Absolutely. Always. You know, you, that's, that was, that, I think that's, you know, the, the point I make is when I say trusted advisor, it's someone you, who, who I can turn to and I can say, I'm not okay, actually. And they don't turn to me and say, come on, Neil, pull yourself together, you know, stiff up a lip, all that type of thing. I don't, I don't need to hear that. I don't need anybody to tell me, you know, that things are going to be okay. This will pass. I don't need, I know that. I do know that. What I need to do is I need to have a conversation with someone who doesn't judge me for maybe feeling a little bit scared about what's going on and, and, and anxious about my business and all of these things and just says, oh, you know, that's a good point, Neil. This is what I see. You know, so um, you're absolutely right, Justin. You know, someone who doesn't judge you, but someone who just listens and, mm. and gives you their honest opinion as someone who loves and trusts you. So, Neil, you know, I know that you know, and, and your app and your website, etc., helps people uncover a lot of these um, biases that we have. And you mm. mentioned that, you know, cognitive biases, etc. So, maybe you could give us an idea, an example, a couple of examples of biases that that, that people suffer from. And then, you know, the, the, for Frank's sake, you mentioned, you know, there's a recency bias. You know, we, we, we look at the last three months and we extrapolate that to think that that's going to go on forever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we, one of the classics we see is um, stock markets. You know, when stock markets are booming, you know, everything's going to carry on forever. And then when it's not, it's, it's going to, you know, decline forever. And, and of course, when we look through history, that, that doesn't, that's not representative. But maybe you could chat about some of the biases that you know you know about, some of the biases that people might go, oh, yeah, I'm a bit like that sometimes. But what I'm really interested in, even if we understand our cognitive biases or emotional biases that we, we get, even if we understand it, does it then help us make better decisions? So, so let, me, let me answer the second part of that question first. Okay. Um, Awareness of your behavioral biases doesn't in itself mean that you will make better decisions, right? The same way as we all know that eating too much fat and salt in our diets isn't good for us, yet we still eat food that has fat and salt in, right? We know these things. It doesn't mean that we put them into practice. That's, that's true for all walks of life. It's true for behavioral bias. But what it does do is it gives you in black and white, this is who I really am. This is what is going on in my unconscious. I have my subjective self, who I think I am, and how and, I, and how I how I see myself in the world, how I see myself with my friends and relationships. Then there is the objective reality, which is actually who I really am, which is where my values and principles live. Um, you, you know, and, and actually that's why sometimes we fall out with friends and those nearest us because it's not that they have annoyed us, but they've actually prodded one of our values or guiding principles, and we uh, we don't like that. So does knowing about them in itself change anything? Probably not. But actually, if you give people a, 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 a clear enough explanation of what's going on in their heads, what we found is it allows you to, to do two things. The best thing it allows you to do is it allows you just to pause and go, hang on. If I now know that this bias that I have, which is quite strong, can lead to a suboptimal outcome for me, maybe I should pause. Maybe I should just look a little bit deeper, a little bit further. If I still make the same decision, that's fine. You know, there's no such thing as a bad decision. There is a such, there is such a thing as a decision that could be um, more optimal in its outcome, but there's no such thing as a bad decision. You know, we make decisions based on every bit of input that we have, our values, our principles, and that's the right choice for us. Um, but if we understand the strength of biases, then it can just allow us just to go, I'm just going to stop for a second. You know, so when you go into, you know, everybody heard this, the bias I talked about earlier, framing. If you went into a supermarket and you saw two yogurts on the shelf and one said 80% fat free and one says contains 20% fat. Now, those are the same product, right? But if you are aware that you are highly susceptible to framing, it just may make you think, oh, hang on, 
that's the same thing. And that changes the outcome of the decisions that you make. So having an awareness is one thing. But when you understand the strength of those biases, not only does it allow you to pause, it also allows you to do what, what is called put in place a, a commitment device. And, and that's not actually a device. It's a process whereby you change a, a habit that means that you have to pause, that you don't just make a decision based on what you're hearing. You have another process. So for the best one to, to give you an example is if you were trying to quit smoking, give your cigarettes to somebody else and you have to ask them for a cigarette. That little step extra has been um, evidenced, has been proven to help people get on the right path to quit smoking just by saying to someone, can I have a cigarette, please? As opposed to pulling them out themselves. So, so understanding about them is one thing, but actually, you know, you need to then consciously say, that's me. That's fine. I get who I am. I'm going to do something about it. Does, does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Absolutely. cool. And, and then going back to the first part of your question, we're doing this back back to front. Um, so I've talked about framing. Let me tell you about what is known, and this is very relevant today. Um, what psychologists refer to as the mother of all behavioral biases. The behavioral bias that is can be so damaging in the way we make decisions that psychologists have studied this for years and years and years. And it's a bias called confirmation bias. Now, many of you may have heard of this, but confirmation bias is where we have an opinion or a view and we only seek evidence that supports that view, whilst at exactly the same time, ignoring evidence that could prove we're wrong. So, and there are many political um, examples I can give you. I'm sure the one has popped to everybody's mind where confirmation bias was rife. Um, but of course, when we're making decisions, if I have an opinion or I, ha or I have a view, um, it's not a fact. And I need to make decisions based on fact. And I need to make decisions based on evidence. So if I think that, you know, let me give you a really, it's an untrue example of me. Just assume I believe that global warming isn't real. I think it's a hoax, right? When I go onto Google and I start to search for evidence to prove that I'm right and everybody else in the world is wrong, all I need to do is type in, is global warming a hoax? And I would get returned on Google a whole raft of articles that play to my bias. If I type, what I should have done is I should just type in evidence for global warming. And I should read a scientific paper where there is a counter argument by scientists, right? And I'm giving, this is a, a, a really straightforward example. But if I just search for, if I believe the people who have blue eyes are more intelligent than anybody else, if I search for, are blue-eyed people intelligent, I will get responses that say, yes, they are. But if I type in eye color and intelligence, then I'm going to get a much more rounded bit of information passed back to me where I can make a choice. So confirmation bias is a very dominant behavioral bias in every single one of us. And we need to be really careful that we aren't making decisions that especially can have an impact on our long-term financial well-being that are based on just something that we think is right. It should be based on something that we know is right, because that's where we get into a place of making decisions that will have the right impact on, on, on us. Um, so if that's framing, we've done. We've done confirmation bias. You know, I could talk about this for like hours and hours and hours, right? Um, so let me tell you about one that is really relevant as well now, which is called action bias. So... Action bias is where we feel that we have to do something. You know, so the stock markets are falling um, and they're falling and they're falling. And you feel like I've got to do something. I, I, I can't sit back and do nothing. I've got to do something. And often when action bias kicks in, the outcomes are um, have been proven to be more than suboptimal. You know, people, people will just do something and then sit back on back to something you said, Justin, about the emotional comfort, they'll sit back and go, I now emotionally feel better because I've done something. But it doesn't mean that the action they've taken will be beneficial to them. And that may see them coming out of the stock market at the bottom. 
And then as the market rises, thinking, oh, I've got to do something again, I'll go back in and going back in at the top. You know, so action bias is a really powerful bias. Now, I'll share with you a piece of really interesting research. Trust me, it's interesting. Um, City University in London carried out this research. They did an analysis of um, English Premier League goalkeepers. And they looked at every penalty that was taken over a 10-year period, I think it was. And they plotted on a chart the position the ball ended up in on every one of those penalties. And they mapped that to where the goalkeeper went, moved to when the penalty was taken. And they found empirically that if a goalkeeper stands still and does nothing, they will save 70% more penalties. And yet, because they are fueled with an action bias, they can't stand still because that looks like they're lazy and they're not doing their job. They have to move. And the outcome is they save less penalties. No, so action bias is quite um, it, it's quite a dominant emotional trigger in us just to, you know, I've got to do something. I can't do nothing because I'm lazy. But I'll finish off by saying something I said on a call the other day. When you make the conscious effort to not do something, you have been through a cognitive process, which is actually taking action. Your action is to not take action. So we shouldn't confuse inaction with being lazy. It actually takes conscious effort to not do something. So, you know, understanding when and when to apply this um, will benefit you from a decision-making process. That's, mm. that's three. Brilliant. No, that's really, that's brilliant. Um, I'm just thinking about some of the, um, for, for, for any of the listeners or the audience who um, might like to know more about this uh, and read up on these subjects. Um, I know that I've read in the past uh, a book by, I can never pronounce his name correctly, but I can put it in the notes later. Dan, Dan Arely, um, predict, I think it's. Yeah, Dan, Dan, Dan Arely. Yeah. Dan Arely. And, and he, um, his story was, I, I think he, I think he was Israeli. Uh, yes. I yep. And I think he suffered in a bomb explosion, some horrendous burns. He ended up in a hospital with kind of a 70 to 80% uh, burns to his body. And the nurses would used to come to him uh, and take, change his bandages every two or three days. And um, they would take the bandages off very quickly. Um, and of course, that he suffered huge pain when, when these bandages were taken off. As, you know, it's a middle, it was, you know, we all had a plaster pulled off quickly. Um, and, it, and it hurts, but of course, they were pulling these bandages off quickly. And he would say, no, don't do that, do them slowly. And they would say, no, we know best. You know, we've been doing this in nursing for so long, et cetera, et cetera. And they do it very quickly. Anyway, eventually he recovered and he ended up in America um, and he became a doctor and a psychologist and all the rest of it. And, he, and then he's a lot of research going back to prove <laughs> that, that it wasn't a benefit. And the only benefit it was to, to the nurses because they could get the job done quickly and they found it quite painful to do themselves emotionally. Um, and he actually illustrated that it was it's more painful pulling a bandage off a, off a burned body than it is doing it quickly. Um, and it, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that they, in essence, learned and been passed on and passed down from nurse to nurse doctor to doctor, um, based on no actual evidence, just, just that actually they thought that they, they thought it was the best way to do it, or they thought it was the kindest way to do it. And, uh, and it, you know, from his, from his aspect, it wasn't at all. Um, so that's this quite is, a, that, yeah, sorry. This is really interesting, right? Because there's a, so, so there is a, there's a, there's a behavioral, it, it's a, it's a behavior, it's a cognitive bias. There's a, there's a bias called um, the Semmel vice reflex. And it's named after a, um, a Hungarian physician called Ignaz Semmelweis, who was born in 1825, I think, in Hungary. And he was a, um, a what would now be a, um, a, a midwife. He, he used to deliver babies in the, uh, in the early, mid-1800s. And what he was finding was that a lot of people who would go in to have a baby would have the baby, but then would get seriously ill from infection. And... When he would speak to his, the other doctors about this, they would all say, no, we've done this for you. What we do is we go in, we, we deliver the baby, then we go into the next room, we deliver another baby. And, and he was saying, yeah, but 
there's got to be a way we can reduce infection. And he, and he figured out that the best way to stop infection in hospitals and therefore patients dying was to wash your hands after each operation. That simple. So, and now, of course, in 2020, that's obvious, but in 1860, I think it was, um, it wasn't obvious. And what the surgeons were doing was they would deliver one baby and then they wouldn't wash their hands or get changed even and go into the next room and do the same thing over and over again. And infection was rife. And what the research found when this was looked into was what you just said, Justin, that actually the norm amongst the medical community was this is how we do this. And it took someone like Ignaz Semmelweis to say, this isn't true. And what happened was he pushed and pushed and pushed so much that the medical director of a hospital in 1878 decided to build in a process of every surgeon washing their hands after every operation and before every operation. And infection rates plummet, plummeted that, you know, downwards in the right direction. And it became a, 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 a universal norm that surgeons then started to wash their hands. And it's now the norm, obviously, in every hospital. So it takes people you know, like him and like Dan Ariely did to say, is that right? Just because that's the way we do things, does it mean it's right? And, and, and Dan Ariely's work to prove that actually ripping bandages off quickly was actually not beneficial at all um, has, has had much far-reaching, has, has had more of a far-reaching impact in the medical community than I think he would have imagined when he set out on that journey. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's a couple of other books that, um, that I've read in the last couple of years, which, um, which I think has impact on this type of work. Um, there was one called Black Box Thinking. Uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with that, which is, um, you know, all about the black box from aircraft and, uh, and, and the information it provides uh, for the accident investigation board so that they could reflect on the processes and the procedures being taken taken by the uh, the pilots at the time um and that was uh, that was a great book which really looked at a story of a i think it was a ba pilot whose wife went into hospital uh, to have a minor operation and um in maybe west middlesex hospital something like that minor operation went in with his two young girls said goodbye to mum was going to come and pick her up uh, again that evening um has a phone call at three or four o'clock in the afternoon your wife's now in a coma uh, and she sadly eventually died. And after all the grief, et cetera, of course, he went through, he went back into the hospital a week or so later and said, by the way, when's the investigation going to happen? And they went, well, what do you mean? And he's like, well, surely my wife's died. You know, you'll, you'll, you know I'm a pilot. So we have investigations when um, something goes wrong. Um, what are you going to do? Well, it's just one of those things. It's, this is just the way it is. And he's like, well, that can't be right, surely. Um, and it turned out, or it transpired, that the whole story was that uh, they, uh, the anaesthetist, had tried to give her an anaesthetic, um, and they obviously have to put a tube in to keep the uh, to, to keep the breathing and the airway open. Um, they they didn't manage to do that correctly. They she ended up losing huge, you know, not getting the right oxygen into her body. Um, they ended up with three consultants trying to get this tube down her. Couldn't do it. The nurses stood there because she'd spotted what was going on and had come along with the, I can never say this word, it's the, the tracheotometry kit. The, bit, the thing when they put something through the through here and they get the airway going when they when they blocked the airway. And she stood there going, I'm ready for it because the blood, the oxygen levels are so low now. You, you, you know, I know you're going to turn to me and go, we've got to get an airway in this way. And they didn't. They just kept, they just kept on, kept on, kept on trying to get this airway in. And eventually, of course, she suffered. Sadly, very sadly, um, uh, brain damage because of the lack of oxygen and then died. But the lessons learned from the processes and actually when they reflected and he brought in a whole procedure across the world now that actually after every something going wrong in a medical procedure now has to have a full investigation. This is relatively new. I mean, this is within the last 10 years. And you kind of go, well, that's crackers. Why wasn't that happening before? But again, I think it's just another example of behavioral biases, people acting under pressure, not standing back and going, okay, so what do we now do? Or even having a procedure to kind of follow that, yes, I'm emotional about the circumstances at the moment. If I'm emotional, how do I now react? Can I follow some kind of set procedure that I've thought about? Oh, this is what I now do when this circumstances um, presents itself. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. There's a, you know, I talked just Reese just then about confirmation bias. Um, that, that there's a great bit of work from the medical um, the medical industry. A guy from Harvard University called Jerome Groupman who did this work, and what he he looked at um, he took hundreds and hundreds of doctors, and he gave them all a hypothetical situation to. Um, to, to first off to diagnose and then to give a prognosis off the back of. And they all looked at the evidence, they looked at the symptoms of the of the, the fictional people, and they all came to their own conclusion that the way that you that the way that we treat this, the way that we deal with this is like this. And that was fine. He locked all of their answers in. He then went back to half of them and he said, I've got more information on their symptoms. So you, you have their symptoms, but there's more information we have. There it is. Tell me what you think. And of the half that he went back to, only 10% of them changed their diagnosis and their prognosis. The rest of them said, no, we were right the first time. Don't need to see any more information. We know what we're doing. We're right. And it kind of relates back to the black box story, you know, that the, 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 the doctors kind of go, no, this is how we do things. And when they're presented with new evidence, confirmation bias kicks in and they go, no, I know what I'm doing. I believe what I'm doing is right. And what they should be doing is they should be then going, oh, hang on, new evidence. Let me examine the new evidence and let me see if this new evidence changes the way that I think of things. And if we can put our, aside our ego and the fact that we always think that we're always right, then what you end up doing is you see the world from a much more fact-based perspective. And, and, you know, Groupman's research from at Harvard showed that actually one of the areas in, in life where this is um, really dominant, confirmation bias is dominant, is in the medical world. Um, it's, it's why you should ask for second opinions, you know, yeah. because yeah. another pair of eyes gives you a different view. And I, th I think this can be the same in the investment world as well. I mean, we've had a number of examples, haven't we? We, we, we can see that lots of people make decisions um, uh, because of greed, we, we've had a whole mis-selling scandal recently, something called mini bonds. You know, people have been very much um, encouraged to get into a bond that's paying 8% and then suddenly realising that it goes pop and um, why, you know, oh dear, that's quite unfair. You know, I got sold the wrong thing. And it's like, well, if something's promising 8% and the base rate's 1% or 2% or what have you, then, you know, the, there has to be an expected risk attached to that um, safe investment but of course our emotional greed comes into play and then we get attracted to it and it's presented in a nice way and we and and sometimes again we get confirmation biases from from you know our friends invested in it or a, a name a name that we know on the telly is associated with it or a footballer or, or what have you and you see those types of things going on and then of course um you know we last year we had the scenario with uh Neil Woodford with um with with his investment you know he 20 years of fantastic investment performance and he was the the, the superstar of the investment world and and then he runs an investment thing which goes pop and i i wonder what biases Neil's Neil was going through at the time to to make those decisions you know he's a clever guy i met him a couple of times and you know i was you know i, I was i was shocked what happened really was shocked and then i must admit i did look at one of the ways I try and filter my biases is that obviously we're advising lots of people on how to invest their money. And I sit there and I then think, okay, so I'm, I'm of the academic evidence type of uh, advisor. I, I, I buy the markets. I turn them in as cheaply as possible. I buy the value in the small cap because they've given us a higher expected return. The academic evidence shows that that's the case. But I sit there and look at it and then I go, okay, so why am I now wrong? I've come to a conclusion. So let's say I was having to justify a different approach. Why am I wrong? Why is it that I've come to this conclusion and have I got confirmation bias going on? You know, um, yeah, it's interesting because if you say if you've come to the conclusion that you're wrong later down the road, you're not you're not suffering with confirmation bias, you're suffering with hindsight bias. You know, where we look back and we go, ah. I've made the wrong choice here because now how it's playing out. I wish I wish I'd have done this instead. Um, and hindsight bias is quite powerful as well. We do it quite often. Why did I do that? Um, but if you're making it, if you are genuinely making a decision today 
based on all of the evidence and the facts available to you today, then that's the best you can do. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up um, if later down the line, because of the way that things play out, the, what we thought would happen doesn't happen in exactly the way that we hoped it would have. That's just That doesn't mean the decision was wrong. It just means that the journey that happens from the point the decision was made didn't take the trajectory that we we thought it would. There's nothing wrong with that. That we 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 can't um, like I said, we can't beat ourselves up as long as the decisions we are making are based on evidence and and fact and not just how we an opinion. You know, mm, absolutely. Now, I preach that we're coming up to eleven forty-seven, and I've been hogging all the conversation. And I just want to go to our audience and go: Has anyone got a question for Neil? Has anyone like to ask him something that um, that I haven't? Please raise your hand and we'll unmute you. I think we can do that. It's probably Ryan. I'm not sure, but as someone must have. Yes, I think some... Alan's got a question. He's raised his hand, and uh, I think he should be unmuted now. Over to you, Alan. Great. Um, yeah, my question is: um, the guest speaker said that um, in this current um, situation, one of the things that he does is he tends to write notes, um, and I wondered just how routine actually uh, helped with bias if you were able to uh, set yourself a, um, a regular routine particularly in the current situation whether that had an impact on um, your thinking your thought process and your bias it it it, it can um alan a great question and it can have an impact on your bias um if you if you do it pro- if you really do it routinely if you start to do it on a daily basis then of course what happens over a period of time very short typically 7 days um it starts to form into a habit and when we when we start creating habits like this um they can have a um because it's because it's conscious and it's in front of, it's in front of mind it can have an impact on how we then process information and therefore have an impact positively hopefully on our behavioral biases um but the thing that we need to remember about our biases is that, you know, like I said earlier on, they're not right or wrong. They're just who, they make us who we are. And that's a, that's the beauty of being a human being. That's why I love doing what I do, because everybody is different and everybody is unique. Um, but but actually having a having a framework that sounds terribly academic, having a framework to um, to make better decisions and, and building in habits that allow us just to see the world in a slightly different way um, has been proven to be much more beneficial. So, you know, I, when I said up, up, uh, kind of the, at the top, top of the chat that I, um, I write things down, I, I don't do it that religiously. What I do is I did it yesterday um, because we, the, the new lockdown was announced. I wanted to go back and, and look at that at some point and, and try and figure out how I felt because one of the things that we know from the field of psychology is memory recall, um, is in essence a best guess of what happened. We can't recall memories with any clarity and and real detail. We just can't do it. Um, so we kind of we we create the, the narrative of a memory when we recall it. Whereas if I can go back to a book, so if somebody says to me, "How did you feel during the lockdown when the second lockdown was announced?" I, I, I can't remember how I felt, but if I can read in black and white how I felt at the moment, it'll allow the memory that they get to recall to be a little clearer. And then that allows me to to use that information to make decisions in the future. So um, so that's a very long-winded answer to your question. But yeah, if you if you start to do things that become habitual, then they can, can have an impact on how you process information and then arrive at a decision. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anyone else? They're all stunned into silence. Look at that. <laughs> oh, I think um, Peter, uh, maybe. Peter, have you got a question? Oh, Dish. there you go, Peter. I've taken you off mute. Thank you. I'm holding up a book cover so you can see it says The Artist's Way at Work, because this is a book I found really helpful. It has a section in it, which I expect Neil knows all about, called Morning Pages, <laughs> where if you write down your thoughts first thing in the morning and you keep them to yourself, it's not something you would share with your mentor, which is what you were discussing earlier. Just, and then you can actually see how the same thoughts come over and over again. And then you, then you can change them. At least that's what I've discovered. And it's well, really, Peter, really worked for me. 
it's, you're absolutely right. It's not. It's a, it's about you know. I, when I, I said this, I've said this already. There's no such thing as a bad decision. You know, behaviors are behaviors. Who we are is who we are, and I love that about being a human being. But there is a massive, huge benefit in having self awareness of who you are, and how yeah. you and how you think, and how you behave. And if you write these things down, like you've just said, Peter, and you keep them to yourself, it's only you. It's you. Mm. It gives you an insight into who you really are. And that doesn't mean that that's wrong. It just means that's who you are. And if there's things that you are doing and thinking and you see them written down in black and white and you see them recurring time and time again, you know exactly where to focus your attention as opposed to thinking, I, I wonder why I did that. Because that you'll never get an answer to that. Whereas if you if you can re- reference back to your morning notes and, and go, oh, look at this. I've had the same recurring thought 25 times now or variations <laughs> of it. And, yeah. and every time it's made me feel like this and I don't like feeling like that. I now know the root cause. And when I know the root cause, I can then go through processes to change the way that I start to think. And that is hugely beneficial. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Great. Anyone else got anything uh, they'd like to contribute? Hmm. Ryan, I think you're muted. There we go, Ken. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Neil, I was just thinking that back in the 1980s, there was a tremendous push on group consensus. So presumably, if I put six people together with six biases, does that mean I come out with the best decision? That what I, you in the, Sorry, everybody else who's asked a question, but that wins the star prize for the best question. Um, <laughs> it's, um, there is... So, Group consensus, group think, in group thinking, um, it, variations on a theme. Um, and when this was kind of first kicked off, actually in the early 70s, um, thinking, actually, do you know what? If you put a group of people together, then what you should get is the optimal outcome. Um, and that was the hypothesis that was kind of posited at the time. But actually, what research has shown you that that's only sometimes true. Because if you put people in this room, if you put um, six people in the room, for example, who all have strong confirmation bias, they are all susceptible to framing. They are all highly loss averse. And then you ask them to make a decision. Well, actually, they may have different life experiences that they can bring to the decision making process. But unconsciously, they will all be going through a remarkably similar cognitive process that will have an impact on the decision. So the way that group think works best when you put a group of people together to try and land on the optimal decision is by having diverse um, psychological profiles in the room. So you need to, if you do that, then you are more likely to land on a much more balanced decision that the group have come to, to, to agree on. If you don't, what you end up with is what's called herding bias where people just do what everybody else does because they think that's the right thing to do. And you don't get um, kind of deep and meaningful, diverse conversation to try and land on the optimal answer. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a really, um, it's a really interesting one. And, and you see it playing out a lot in um, think tanks when governments pull together people and often, you know, they are highly there's a high confirmation bias in the group. So when the th- when the government put a problem to the people in the think tank, what they do is they typically get out what the government want to get out, because you know the, the, the people in that group are, are, are biased in many ways, um, and they haven't done the proper due diligence to try and find different people, different backgrounds, different viewpoints, and different unconscious behaviours. And the latter point being probably one of the most important parts when you're trying to ask a group to land on the right question. Hope that answers your question, Ken. Yes, it does. Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. So we've got time probably for one more if uh, if anyone's got a, something we can wrap up with. Ah. Oh, yes, Melanie. Hi, Melanie. Hi there. I've got a question for um, Neil. I was just thinking about what he was saying about unconscious bias. Do you think um, HR professionals use that kind of profiling when they interview applicants? Uh, no, but they should. Uh. Uh, I've, I've been, you know, I, 
I work when, before I did set up BIQ. I work for a, like I said to you, FTSE 100 company, and their head, they, their HR department, which hired thousands of people, they they employed 87,000 people around the world, and their head, their HR process was answer a couple of psychometric type questions. Um, we'll do a psychometric profile on you, and that will tell us everything we need to know about you. But actually, they um, if they had an insight into what was going on in that person's unconscious thought processes, um, then what that would that would have given that would provide a much richer understanding of the person and could probably deploy them in a much better um, place within the business. So one of the areas that I, I talk. I do a huge amount of conference speaking, which is typically um, for financial services. But last year, I did one for a H- at a HR conference, and I talked about the power of behavioral insight um, in and in the in the way we engage with people when we're trying to recruit them. And I said, I'm not a recruiter, I'm not a HR professional. But what I do understand is, if you put someone into a job whereby they have to sit down and they, you know, th- there's a whole raft of behavioral biases I could mention. Um, but actually, their their unconscious behavior is completely at odds with the job that you're asking them to do. They won't perform optimally at all. They'll get bored, and they will end up leaving. And actually, how is that benefiting anybody? So um, I think if HR professionals moved on from the psychometric tests that they typically do into a much more richer behavioral insight situation, I think the outcomes for the company and the employees um, would be much greater. That's an opinion. But uh, but um. It's just, it's, I'm not, I'm trying not to fall into confirmation bias myself here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's an opinion, but it, I, I, I feel, um, I'm happy to be proven wrong, of course, but I feel like there's some validity in that. Thank you, Melanie. So, Neil, oh, thank you so much for your time today. Um, you know, <laughs> traveling all the way from the Isle of Wight, so it's been, uh, it's, <laughs> it's been brilliant. Where, Neil, where can people find out more about you and the work that you do? So, we, so I'm on, I'm not all over social media. I'm on Twitter um, at, so, at, at Neil Bage, N-E-I-L-B-A-G-E. Um, our website is biq.com, B-E-I-Q.com. Let's see about that. But if people want to, we, we you know, and, and I'm not doing this to promote anything, but we, we do have um, currently only in the Apple Store um, a free app where people can just download the app on an iPhone or an iPad um, and just play a series of behavioral games and figure out some of their own behavioral biases. And if you go on the Apple Store and search for Beam, B-E-A-M, if you put in Beam dash self awareness, um, you can download the app and play for free. We, you know, the data is your data. We never get to see anything, um, and you can just start to figure out some of the stuff that's going on in your heads. And you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, that may make somebody on this call when they're about to make an important decision just pause and think before they do that really mission com- accomplished if that's what happens brilliant that's wonderful well so thank you so much for your time thank you to everyone who's attended this morning um always great to see you all um and uh, i've got no idea what we're doing next friday um <laughs> whether we've got a retirement cafe on there but um we'll find out i'll let you know obviously if our, we got we haven't got one on next friday no there you go kathy's shaking her head there's not one on next friday that means i'm doing something else um <laughs> the following friday <laughs> so um so hopefully uh, uh, the guests keep getting the bar keep getting set higher and higher so um i have no idea who we'll get for, for two weeks time but um it may just be me uh god forbid so um anyway have a great friday everybody um and a, and a good weekend and um uh, well and if you can enjoy the next three weeks of lockdown uh, <laughs> We'll, we'll keep trying to do what we keep trying to do. And um, if you need any help doing anything or want to chat, then please get, get in touch. Bye for now. Thank Stay you. safe. Cheers. Bye-bye. A huge thanks to Neil Bage for joining me on the Virtual Retirement Cafe Coffee Morning. To find out more about Neil, BIQ, and everything we discussed today, you can check out the show notes on our website at theretirementcafe.co.uk, where you'll also find some useful links. As ever, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review on iTunes and be sure to subscribe uh, on our website or your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. I'd really like to give a special mention to Jem Lee, who left a review recently. He said the podcast is a great listen and a very enjoyable and informative show. So thank you very much. Thanks, as always, to the Timeline app for sponsoring the podcast 
and you can find out more about their software on our website too or visiting uh, the timelineapp.co. So until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk.